Welcome to Shattering Myths, the program devoted to those of you who are open to the realization that all of the world's religious, political, economic, military, academic, and media institutions are corrupt, that they are, in fact, counterproductive. I'm Yana. Our number, if you'd like to join us, toll free, 877-300-7645. It was quite a, uh, a night at the Republican debate. Uh, for those who know the term debate, uh, you recognize there is no such thing as political debate, and they were not debating. It was uh, the best you could say that it was uh, question and answer time, but that really isn't fair because, as was pointed out during the quote-unquote debate, the moderator spent more time lecturing, uh, trying to propose their agenda via loosely veiled questions, uh, then the contestants spent answering them. So if you have the moderators spending more time posing their questions than the contestants are answering them, you, um, you really have a staged event to project the, the view of the station hosting such a calamity. It was um, something, though, that struck me about this that uh, a few people have mentioned. Um, in fact, Rush Limbaugh did a marvelous piece on it uh, yesterday in an hour of monologue. I listened to about 10 minutes of it, but uh, he got it all out in 10 minutes. In fact, it was actually a fairly brilliant statement uh, by um, Rush Limbaugh. He said that, that the Republicans have acted like traitors, that they have been, um, they have completely uh, capitulated, and that their recent agreement to take the debt ceiling up to $19.5 trillion removes their only opportunity to, to differentiate Republicans from Democrats. It removes the only possible uh, issue that Republicans can say, look what's happened under the Obama administration with the, the U.S. debt doubling. And they can't claim that they were the party that had promised to constrain the debt. As a matter of fact, he brought up the pledge that Republicans had made the year before uh, during the elections in which they took control of Congress, where they said that they would absolutely diminish discretionary spending, and yet it has been increasing at an 80% compounded rate. They uh, said that they would uh, uh, work to balance the federal budget, and yet we've never had such runaway deficit spending. Under their promise, the exact opposite of what they pledged has occurred. And Rush Limbaugh was specific. He went through each of the pledges the Republicans had made to earn the votes of um, Republicans and those who are fiscally responsible as independents. And then he itemized the disaster that they had brought upon this country by doing exactly the opposite of what they pledged. So he says, what really is the difference between them? If you're a Republican, don't you feel abandoned? Don't you feel like you have been misled, that uh, you have been offered a bill of goods that you've been lied to? And so with that being the case, here was a debate on the economy, and not any of them brought up in any substantial way this deal that had been made by the Congress, capitulating on the debt, giving the government a blank check up to nearly $20 trillion. All the while, of course, Republicans are portrayed as those that don't play along, that those, don't, that don't, those that uh, work in hostility to as opposed to cooperate with the president and, uh, and uh, the Democrats, when exactly the opposite is true. It's amazing how the media manages to twist everything. It's the Republicans who are capitulators, who haven't gotten anything, who have constantly rolled over and played and played for dead, who have done exactly the opposite of what they pledged to do, and yet they've been blamed for everything. It's an amazing world. 
and yet in this economic debate, the debaters blame the media. They blamed um, the uh, Obama administration, but they never took responsibility for their, their own party. Pretty amazing. And I don't think there was a single plan presented at that debate that would uh, cause the economy to grow. I was listening. It was interesting. Uh, I was listening to the radio in a, in a very liberal community in the central Virginia, and the, the host of the program, who was extremely liberal, was talking about all the great points that Bernie Sanders had made about the economy and working class people and not, not having a decent job and, and how 60%, he said, of, uh, uh, oh, I guess it was a little less than that, 40% of the people of this particular county couldn't get a job where they could earn a uh, sustainable wage and how horrible that was. And then he asked the candidate for uh, for the local board, uh, for the county board of uh, supervisors, what are you going to do to change that? And his comment was, you know, I've spent a lot of time with the employers in this community because what we need is more employers. And uh, if I had my wish, the thing that I would wish upon this county is to bring in more employers. But I will tell you that when I talk to the employers, they tell me without reservation and uniformly that their biggest problem is that they can't hire people. Their inability to find people who are motivated to work and able to work. And these are not jobs. They're not trying to find people who can be rocket scientists. They're not trying to find people who can uh, program computers. They're not trying to find people who have uh, superior intellect. They're trying to find people who can just do ordinary jobs, who will show up on time, who are motivated to work on behalf of the company and can be counted upon. They can't find them. So all of this Bernie Sanders bleeding heart, you know, the, uh, the businessman and the one percenters, they're stealing from you. And what you need is a, is a decent, honorable job that pays you what you deserve. Now, the problem is the people he's talking to, the people he appeals to. They aren't motivated to work because the government has provided them a better deal than working. They aren't trained to work because they haven't taken responsibility for themselves, for their lives, for their families, preferring instead to rely upon the promises of government. As I travel about, what I find is help wanted ads everywhere, and yet I find people loitering around liquor stores. Oh, they have their fancy phones. They typically even have cars all decked out, but they loiter. They're ill-prepared, ill-motivated to work in a society that is begging for people to work. It is a genuine problem of our age, and it was not mentioned during this debate of the party that capitulated. And I would ask you, if you are a conservative, if you are a Republican, why do you endorse, why do you vote for people who consistently let you down. People who do the opposite of what they say they're going to do. I would also ask those who are patriotic what an army surveillance blimp was doing in Pennsylvania. Who are they surveying? Who do they think is the enemy? Who are they trying to protect? And from whom? If it was uh, hovering above a military base, it sounds like they're trying to protect the military. But who's surrounding the military, American citizens? Are they trying to protect the U.S. military from the American citizens? And then who is the enemy? Why weren't those questions asked? Why wasn't it asked why the FBI has one of the largest air forces in the world and has developed this air force? while uh, being part of the Department of Homeland Security in conjunction with the NSA and is using that Air Force to spy on Americans, tracking their cell phone use, their Internet use, their credit card use? Why aren't those questions being asked? 
speaking of questions that were not asked, you know when the Abominator says we're going to uh, go to war against the Islamic State because of the two um, photoshopped, jury-rigged, mock assassinations of two Americans that ought not have even been in Syria. And they, uh, uh, he said because of that, he interrupted his uh, golf game to say, we're going to go to war against the Islamic State. And I want to tell you two things. One is the Islamic State is not Islamic, and number two, they're not a state. Well, that'll come as a surprise to anybody with, uh, with one ounce of intelligence. But I would tell you this, and uh, you should consider this, that he said he would not put troops on the ground. And yet, excuse me, the cameras mounted to U.S. Special Troops helmets <laughs> broadcast a raid two days ago where American troops not only were on the ground, they raided an Islamic State prison. They raided that prison to free not the victims of terror, but the perpetrators of terror, Kurd militia. And they engaged with the Persmurga. They embraced death, the Kurdish jihadists. And what's amazing is that the, uh, the group of Kurdish jihadists from which the United States did their pal thing with, the very next day, they were bombed by the Turks. And what's also interesting is the United States said, well, what you saw, you're going to see more of. That Americans are going to do two things in, uh, in Syria. One is that we are going to conduct more joint raids with the Kurds. And number two, that we're going to deploy squadrons of Apache helicopters in Syria. And that we're going to do it also in Iraq, and we're going to use our Apache helicopters to run close air support for the American troops working with the Kurds. The following day, of course, the Turks, using the same air base that we would use, flew a bombing run over that exact same base, killing the Kurds that we had gone to war with, using American airplanes and American bombs. Can you imagine a war gone that awry? We'll return to this subject when Shattering Mist continues after the break. So now in Syria, we're going to have Apache gunships, uh, manned by Americans, of course, flying uh, right above the, uh, the jihadists that we have uh, armed directly and indirectly with uh, anti-aircraft uh, missiles. Uh, that ought to turn out really well for America. Uh, and uh, we will uh, have um, Kurdish troops, uh, which we will have boots on the ground, as we did just uh, this past weekend, uh, that are being bombed by the Turks. All the while, uh, the Russians are uh, will be flying uh, bombing missions uh, against the very groups that we will be partnering with. Uh, it really doesn't sound like a recipe to, for disaster to me. Oh, and by the way, um, the Russians reminded us something that the Iraqis affirmed, which is that we have no right to be there because the Iraqis did not ask us to uh, uh, to put uh, troops in uh, in Iraq or in Syria, and the Syrians didn't ask us to do it. We weren't invited by either country, so we've simply invaded both countries in violation of international law, and. Uh, the reality is here, and there was an, an editorial that I read, uh, Headline News uh, had it, uh, and uh, their um, take was, America's military cannot handle the fact that they've been outmaneuvered by Putin and the Russians, and that, uh, and that around the Muslim world, Putin and the Russians are seen as effective, as uh, as uh, um, action-oriented, uh, and that America is being seen as useless and, um, and uh, unreliable. And so America's military has got its, uh, itself in a twit over this and wants to demonstrate that those Ruskies can't rob us of our opportunity to destroy and kill. And so we are upping the ante in Syria to show where every bit is uh, as uh, murderous as those Ruskies are. Yep, that's, uh, that's your country for you. Uh, so very impressive. 
Speaking of something that's not very impressive, a senior Vatican priest, stripped of his post after admitting being in a gay relationship, has launched a scathing attack on the Roman Catholic Church. In a letter to Pope Francis, Father Bergoglio, this month, uh, Karasma, uh, Karamsa, I should say, C-H-A-R-A-M-S-A, Karamsa, accused the church of making the lives of millions of gay Catholics a living hell. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. He criticized what he called the Vatican's hypocrisy in banning gay priests, even though he said that the clergy was full of homosexuals. Yeah, I think that's probably true. That is pretty ridiculous, isn't it? That the church is... Uh, is um, banning gay priests, even though that the clergy is full of homosexuals. The 43-year-old says that while the Roman clergy is full of homosexuals, it is also frequently violently homophobic. And he calls on all gay cardinals, gay bishops, and gay priests to have the courage to abandon this insensitive, unfair, and brutal church. No, the church has long been insensitive, unfair, and brutal. And uh, why were they uh, part of it for so long? Why did they, uh, all of these gay priests, spend uh, so much time investing in uh, this religious institution now to abandon it? Anyway, he says that he can no longer bear the homophobic hate of the church, the exclusion and marginalization, the stigmatization of people who are gay. Those whose human rights are denied by the church. That's yeah, interesting in this regard. First of all, they, they made the decision that, that priests would all be uh, men and that none would be married. So that's depriving women of any opportunity to do anything within their institution other than be servants of the men, nuns, um, which is a pagan term, as is priest, by the way, in the way that the Roman Catholic uses his father. Uh, from Imperial Rome, uh, that they have uh, put themselves so in a position where only people who are not interested and men who are not interested in women can be part of their hierarchy. So how in the world are you supposed to, if that was your intent, to represent the covenant, which is a marriage between a man and a woman, uh, symbolizing the our Heavenly Father and Spiritual Mother, uh, conceiving and raising and protecting and nurturing children. If 100% of those that are going to be in positions of power within your organization are to be men severed from a relationship with women. Hmm. I guess that's not your intent, is to model the covenant. Your intent is to have a man-centric institution. And you wonder why a huge percentage, maybe even the preponderance, of these men are homosexuals. If you are somehow confused and think that there is no way that an institution like the Roman Catholic Church can be so harsh against uh, homosexuality and yet be comprised of homosexuals, then I would like to point your attention to the founder of the religion promoted by the Roman Catholic Church, Paul. Paul had one love in his life. It was Timothy. Yosha, or Yahweh, specifically says that uh, Paul had a fascination with the male genitalia. And uh, uh, yet he wrote harsh things about homosexuality. So it is, uh, it is not uncommon in Christianity to be a house divided against itself. It's a story that just came out that whereby the United Nations is saying that 50,000 North Koreans have been sent abroad to work in China and to a lesser degree Russia in conditions that amount to forced labor. The workers earn almost nothing. They are underfed and they are forced to work up to 20 hours a day. The employers pay significantly higher amounts, not to the workers, but to the North Korean government. Forced to slave labor. The North Korean government is paid 
approximately $1.2 billion a year for this foreign worker, foreign slave program. You know how communism uh, claims that, that it, uh, it serves the common man, it, it takes the worker, and, and the worker is elevated to power. That's why the, uh, the hammer and sickle, it's the worker that's put in charge. It's the worker that is elevated above the employer. And that the state creates the, a condition where the common person has power. Yeah, not so much, huh? What's the most communist nation on earth? North Korea. What has North Korea done? Well, it's disempowered everyone. And uh, it has created uh, what is the largest slave economy. Hmm. So much for rhetoric, huh? Late Monday night, a, a series of Saudi-led airstrikes with, of course, American weapons leveled a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Yemen, effectively denying medical access to more than 200,000 people. One staff member was uh, injured as the hospital's personnel were evacuated in between the first and second bombing. The quote from the um, Doctors Without Borders reads, this attack is yet another illustration of the complete disregard for civilians in Yemen, where bombings have become a daily routine. The bombings, of course, are being perpetrated by Saudi Arabia. The uh, charity, uh, Medicines Sans Frontiers, which is a French acronym, MSF, Doctors Without Borders, said the hospital's coordinates, just as had happened in Afghanistan, had been regularly shared with the coalition before the strikes. And yet they bombed it anyway. It wasn't by accident. Speaking of weapons making a bad situation worse, this dateline is from Syria. CNN sent in a reporter, and it said that lightly armed, poorly equipped, and exhausted by months under fire, but determined to keep fighting. This reality is the way of life on the front line against ISIS. Who do you think they're um, with? What is the only organization that is actually trying to defend themselves against ISIS, other than Hezbollah, which, of course, is uh, the Iranian uh, special forces? It would be the Kurds. These uh, Kurds and their fellow uh, jihadists are trying to stop the advance of the world's most feared terrorist, hiding out less than a mile away across the plains in northern Syria. They are trying to defend what they now refer to as Kurdistan. That's the very area that the Turks are bombing. And uh, Erdogan came out today to say, I'll bomb the Kurds wherever and whenever I like. These are the Kurdish YPG. Yeah, there's three different names for the, uh, the Kurds. The YPG is one. The uh, uh, PKK is, uh, is another. And the Persmurga is the third. Of course, they all have the same command and control structure. They all have the same allegiance. They, uh, they're, they're just three different names for the same thing. It's like calling the Republican Party the GOP. They are proud and brave, but an irregular force, scrappily clad in plaid t-shirts as well as camouflage gear, and armed with hunting rifles alongside their ancient AK-47s. This is no high-tech war. The Kurds, with just a few rocket-propelled grenades between them, are trying to prevent ISIS from breaking through their lines. That's not true, really. ISIS could care less about the Kurds. Of course, he says, we have mortars, but they're all homemade. There are no home bees. There are no armored cars here. The fighters are crammed into aging minibuses. Even the uniforms are ragtag. You know, there is no, <laughs> there's no army here, so there wouldn't be uniforms. The United States, of course, says it's trying to help relieve the shortage of supplies. On October 11th, more than 100 parachutes floated down through the night sky in northern Syria, each attached to a pallet of weapons and ammunition, all to arm the Kurds. 
the airdrop was the first installment in the new U.S. strategy to help the Syrian rebel groups, that's to help the Kurds, because there are no moderate Muslims in uh, Syria that are engaged in militant activities. But the CNN reporter said after asking the question a hundred times and receiving a hundred different answers, the mystery, it is a complete mystery, they said, as to where those armaments remain. No one has a clue. No one has a clue as to who they went to, who's using them. Isn't that swell? The African Union, this is pretty sad, has accused government and rebel forces in the South Sudan of extreme violence. A commission of inquiry has found evidence not only of mass murder, but of torture, of mutilations of bodies, and of mass rapes. They've even found episodes of forced cannibalism. This is on the people in place that had been annihilated by the Arab Muslim regime in the north, losing 2.5 million people in a genocidal Islamic rage. And now they have responded by cannibalism and rape and torture. This is a group of, uh, of animus, mostly, some marginal Christians, but mostly animus. It shows that there really is no good militant. There is no good side in, uh, in this disastrous war. Just in the last two years, tens of thousands of people have died. Another two million have been forced from their homes. And prior to that, 2.5 million were murdered by the Islamic regime. We had mentioned homosexuality. Let me uh, tell you another story that's a little closer to home. Former U.S. Speaker of the House of Representatives, Dennis Hazard. Remember him? Well, he pleaded guilty in a case tied to hush money. The 73-year-old was, uh, this is a Republican Speaker of the House now. You know, that Republican rally cry amongst the religious right, you've got to oppose gay marriage, you've got to oppose homosexuality. Well, he was charged with lying and breaking financial laws in an attempt to pay a $3.5 million bribe to cover up his misconduct. He's going to uh, serve six months in prison. Not for um, having sex with with uh, one of his male interns. No. He's uh, going to uh, serve time in prison for trying to bribe that male homosexual intern to uh, buy a silence. Tells you about the character of both men. Also close to home, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel's just uh, um, foisted a uh, $7.8 billion budget along with historically high property tax increases on uh, the city of Chicago. And uh, the historically high property tax increase was designed for two things. To pay uh, for more police, more public safety. You know, we're, we're a police state after all but mostly to pay for worker pensions. The unfunded mandate. The city has a $20 billion unfunded pension liability to its public workers. $20 billion unfunded pension liability. You know, in the United States, the unfunded mandate for Social Security uh, and uh, Medicare is about $70 trillion. But the United States uh, pushes this problem down the road, sweeps it under the rug by simply printing more money. It actually doesn't print it. It just uh, increases the money supply. And then it uses quantitative easing to create the impression that we can actually borrow money from someone. It's actually the Fed lending us money that it has created out of nothing. 
but charging us an interest rate to, to, uh, to do so. And in the case of a city, in the case of a state, they can't just increase the money supply to, to have this fake money pay for uh, old obligations. And the big obligation is that in the pri in public sector, we have been grossly overpaying. And the means to grossly overpay is the pension uh, system, and it's unfunded. It's a pyramid scheme. Oh, so security is a pyramid scheme where new enrollees pay the benefits of, uh, of, uh, of older enrollees because the, the money that was paid in by the older enrollees has already gone to previous, even older enrollees. But you can't do that. You can't have a pyramid scheme outside of the federal government. So here you go. You've got um, a record $543 million property tax hike over four years, all to fund the unfunded mandates of pensions by public workers and to increase the level of America's military state mentality. Welcome to Chicago. You know, as we consider the utter hubris and stupidity uh, of the United States, uh, arming and fighting alongside the Kurds while American aircraft in the hands of the Turks are using to bomb those same Kurds. And we don't think that the Turks are going to end up killing some Americans in that process or that that's not counterproductive to use your weapons to destroy and kill those that you are arming and fighting alongside. Or that we're in Iraq and Syria and weren't invited into either place. And that we are trying to fight on behalf of Iran against the, uh, against the Sunnis who are trying to take out Assad why we say that we're opposed to Assad and yet trying to partner with Iran who is pro-Assad. And that we're going to have Apache gunships in Syria allegedly fighting on behalf of, uh, I would assume, Hezbollah as they go off against the uh, Islamic State while not having the backing of Iran. And, uh, and, and yet the Iranians, who are now backed by the Russians, are going to have aircraft and munitions that they are going to use against the very groups that we are supporting. And we don't think that's going to lead to a conflict and killing between the United States and Russia. So what happens when that occurs? How does a nation that is so prone to respond to these kind of provocations, the Gulf of Tonkin, let's go to war in Vietnam, the sinking of the Lusitania, let's go to join World War I, the uh, sinking of the Maine, let's go and fight a war against the Spanish, 9-11, let's go invade Afghanistan, weapons of mass destruction, let's go invade uh, Iraq. He was uh, a syphilitic that uh, we didn't like, so let's go bomb Libya. He was buying his weapons from Russia, so let's go bomb Syria. You know, when a nation constantly engages violently based on lies, deceptions, why is it that people not only rally around its flag but join in? And what's going to happen when such a nation finds this next provocation? A Russian's going to end up killing Americans. A Turk's going to kill Americans. Then what? What do we do? You know, here we have been invading countries and, and supplying weapons in a region that has gone from, from hellish to total and complete chaos, all based on our lies and our ruthlessness our weapons. And what is our answer? Let's do more of the same. Well, it's interesting. I began translating the beginning of the, uh, the sixth proverb because it struck me that 
that there was a really awful individual that um, God was trying to bring our attention to. And, you know, it, at one point you'd say, all right, uh, maybe this, um, this individual is King Saul. Is there the possibility that this psalm was written by Doe David and that the horrid individual is the same one that Yahweh denounced and, uh, in his writings and that it's King Saul? And King Saul, of course, is a prototype for the wannabe apostle Paul. And uh, is it uh, this man that has had this disastrous effect on humankind? And is he speaking of him specifically? Because it's always third person, masculine, singular. It's a single individual. But it could be a single individual in terms of Saul during his day, a single individual including Paul in his day. But it also seems to speak of the Torahless One, the one that Christians will know as their Antichrist, even though his message will be very Pauline, very Christian. Also seems to speak of him and of his day and of his influence. In fact, most assuredly, it is also speaking of him. Could it be the third incarnation of the demon-possessed individual? The first known as Shaul, the second known as Paul, the third as the Torahless One. And so I began translating more of this proverb, and we're going to return to it after the top of the hour news and commercial break. And it's going to begin with a very interesting statement about our allegiance to our country and why we shouldn't do such things. 